um, we can we can get started. Um, well, welcome everybody, and thank you for coming tonight. Um, I'm Chris Scovel, the president and uh, and board chair of the Boston Preservation Alliance, and welcome to our first uh, fully virtual annual meeting. Um, last year, we had our meeting about two weeks after the lockdown began, um, and at that time, we had barely heard of Zoom. Um, thankfully. We received the necessary proxies to legally proceed with all of our business last year. And now a year later, uh, these types of meetings are routine. Um, so thank you for all attending and for being members and supporters of the Alliance. And I'd like to thank our financial supporters over the course of the year. Uh, but tonight I'd especially like to call out and thank the Nolan Miller Fund for their second year of sponsoring our annual meeting. Um, this has certainly been a challenging year and that goes without saying, uh, but the Alliance staff have been busier than ever. And I'm pleased to say that despite all the difficulties from 2020, we were able to complete the year without a need to cut staff and with the ability to pivot to some remarkably successful virtual programs, including our fall awards, uh, which were virtual and hosted by Katie Couric. One thing we've all learned this year is that while Zoom is great in many ways, after a long day of meetings, especially on a 70 degree day, a program can go on for too, too long, sorry. So we plan a brief business meeting in order to get to our keynote speaker, uh, who I'm sure you're all here to see. I myself am anxious to hear from Brent Legs as I, as well as the whole Alliance board, have been thinking about and discussing the issue of equity in historic preservation. And I'm looking forward to learning from tonight's presentation. Um, and first, I'd like to introduce Greg Gaylor, uh, the executive director of the Boston Preservation Alliance for a few words of welcome. Thank you, Chris. I too would like to welcome you all tonight and thank each of you for your support and your input and feedback to us throughout the course of the year. We are an alliance. That means our success comes from the support of others, individual members, organizational members, corporate members, and the general public who respond to our request to send letters, send emails, and share ideas with us. I also want to thank our board of young advisors who are involved with the organization at all levels and host many programs, including the popular Libations for Preservation, successfully run virtually in 2020 and coming again this summer. Despite the year we had, we did close 2020 strong, both financially and as advocates. After some brief reports and voting in our new directors, I'll provide a very brief summary of some of the highlights of 2020. But now I'd like to turn it back to Chris for our business meeting. Okay, I think I'm back. Uh, thank you, Greg. Um, so uh, I'd officially like to call this 2021 annual meeting of the Boston Preservation Alliance to order. Uh, the first order of business is to approve the minutes of the 2020 meeting, uh, as I think you can see on the screen. There we are. Um, with uh, with 260 uh, with 260 votes in hand, uh, naming Greg Gaylor as the proxy last year, he and I were able to legally, uh, with the consult uh, under the consultation of council, complete the business of the 2020 annual meeting, as as you see noted uh, on the screen there. Um, can someone please make a motion in the chat to accept these minutes of the 2020 annual meeting? Let's see, I'm. Looking at the chat now, I just need someone to make that motion. There we go. Motion. There we go. Accept. And a second. Okay. Good. Um, and I think we're going to have a uh, a, a poll come up on the screen. Um, and please uh, please vote um, on that. And I'll I'll give uh, a moment for everybody to to respond to that. Uh, how efficient everyone so quickly voting. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Okay, I'll give a give a moment more for everybody to catch up there. Okay. All right. Um, it looks like uh, the motion carries. Uh, thank you very much. The uh, minutes are now approved. Um, moving on, the Alliance has a dedicated board of directors that support our work in so many ways, and I appreciate their time and commitment to the mission of the Alliance to keep the organization moving forward and for their thoughtfulness uh, and support as we navigated through 2020. Um, and I would like, also like to thank our outgoing directors. Uh, ending her term this year is Laura Zorney, who has been a helpful voice from Charlestown and whose experience in nonprofit management have been very valuable. 
Uh, and since I was unable to do it publicly last year, I also want to thank those board members who rotated off the board in 2019, Nick Brooks, Pete Gertica, and Susan Park. Susan, as you know, was the heart and soul of the Alliance uh, for four decades. Uh, as one of our founders, she laid the groundwork upon which we work today. Uh, and last year, she became president emeritus and remains a trusted advisor for the Alliance. So thank you, Susan. Um, and finally, I'd like to acknowledge the sad passing of our longtime board member and friend, Gil Fishman, who passed away in the fall of 2019 after a long illness. Uh, he contributed a great deal to this organization over many, many years, and we miss him dearly. Um, and now for the exciting part of the annual meeting, I'd like to draw your attention to this slide, uh, which hopefully will appear on the screen now. Perfect. Um, and uh, this slide shows our uh, slate of board candidates for this year as recommended by our governance committee and the board of directors. Uh, as a reminder, our directors are generally voted on for three-year terms. You'll see here in blue existing directors requiring a vote to return to the board, most with a three-year term and one for a one-year term. Uh, in red, with your vote, we welcome three new members to the Alliance Board of Directors, Alia Hamada Forrest, Wendell Joseph, and Jeff Marr Jr. We are so excited to have them join us and share their expertise and enthusiasm for our work. Uh, their bios are available online uh, on our website for this meeting and uh, if someone from staff wants to share that in the uh, share that in the chat i would very much appreciate it um and so moving on can someone please make a motion again in the chat to approve this slate of candidates for board of directors all right and thank you carl and a second thank you laura um, and uh, I think we're going to have another poll come up on the screen. And would you all mind um, uh, voting there? I'll give you a moment to look at that. Okay, give a few more seconds. All right, it looks like we're there. Uh, thank you. Uh, the motion carries. Congratulations to all of our board members, old and new. Uh, and now I'm going to turn it over to Sean Geary, our treasurer, for a brief financial report. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Chris. Um, so I just want to uh, say that despite the challenges of 2020, uh, I'm pleased to report that we finished 2020 in a very strong position. Uh, we entered 2021 almost in a, with identical uh, financial place that we began 2020 uh, with, with roughly $575,000 in total assets. This is thanks to a robust system of financial support from our peer-to-peer -peer fundraising campaigns in May through our awards in the fall and an end-to-year-end giving uh, toward our annual fund. Uh, plus, uh, we benefited from some COVID-related savings and as well as very importantly, uh, the payroll protection program um, in the spring. So despite seeing a decline in our, our awards event revenue, we closed the year uh, with only a very small deficit, uh, which if you include a small net gain, um, when one considers the growth of our investments in the Alliance Reserve Funds turned into uh, a, small, a small positive. Our total income for 2020 was $488,000 uh, in our expenses then just under $484,000. As you can see that broken down on the screen here. Uh, in 2021, uh, our budget is just under $520,000 uh, looking forward. So given the uncertainties in this year ahead, this is a deficit buzz, uh, budget, um, but uh, I'm pleased to report that we applied for the second round of uh, paycheck protection funding. Uh, and that has been approved and already been received, which closes the gap between what our projected income is for this year and expenses. Um, so that concludes our financial report for 2020. And Greg is now going to share some highlights of the year for you. Thank you, Sean. Uh, good evening again, everyone. Working remotely certainly brought a new twist on advocacy, but we've found ourselves in just as many, if not more meetings than ever. Things slowed down briefly early in COVID, but picked up quickly and haven't slowed down. Staff attended over 200 physical and virtual meetings and discussions on various projects during 2020, and we engaged with over 50 projects over the course of the year. 
There certainly isn't time to list all those, and I encourage you to explore those on our website, but I would like to highlight a few. I uh, hope you've seen the transformation occurring at City Hall Plaza. We have a healthy, and if Allison could switch that slide there, here we go. Uh, we have a healthy relationship with the city's public facilities department and are in dialogue on projects from libraries to schools. This, was, this work at City Hall Plaza is just one phase and more is to come and the Alliance is proud to have played a central role in completely altering the city's leadership's uh, view from one of hatred to one of long overdue investment and reimagining of City Hall and the Plaza, all within the framework of its original designers. And I thank Mayor Wallace for seeing the light on, on the opportunities at City Hall and we look forward to working with uh, Mayor Janey and future administrations to complete the master plan. We also played an active role down the street in discussions with the Commonwealth regarding the future of the Charles F. Hurley building. While still early, we were able to shift the process for redevelopment that was candidly leaning toward uh, encouraging demolition to one that recognizes unique opportunities for creative, adaptive reuse of this complex, designed by famed architect Paul Rudolph. Stay tuned. Speaking of changes in direction, the Alliance, aligned with some strong neighborhood voices, was able to shift the project near Back Bay Station from one of demolition to a proposal that saves the quirky character of Stanhope Street. There's nothing finalized here, but we thank the proponent H.N. Gorin for moving to a proposal that saves key aspects of this unique stable building. We also took the lead with a variety of neighborhood groups and nonprofit organizations as Mass General Hospital proposed demolishing three of the few remaining historic buildings in the West End. You see two of them here. Conversations between us and MGH began over two years ago, and we may soon hear of some resolution. This has candidly been a very challenging process and with a variety of community needs in addition to preservation being a concern. Now, preservation is certainly not a business that is all successes, we all know that, but we consider losses to be occasions to empower changes in process and perspectives that hopefully build to a stronger preservation ethos and system. Losses, a few of which you see here, include uh, in 2020, the Villa Victoria Church in the South End, the Westgate in Kenmore Square, and Doyle's in Jamaica Plain. Not to mention the countless buildings torn down with no real justification. Naturally occurring affordable housing in older homes is often replaced with market rate condo units, while neighborhood character is deteriorated. And it's the wrong choice environmentally too. Now we've already begun discussions with mayoral candidates to impress upon them that residents are anxious for a new prioritization of preservation over demolition. We spent much of 2020 and are continuing to focus much behind the scenes also on larger policy issues to combat losses of historic resources. And we are encouraged by growing support from city council and others at city hall. And this includes a whole host of things such as adjusting the language of what can be landmarked, enhancing contributions to the emerging legacy fund for Boston, which already has $5 million committed to it for historic resources contributing to a planning process for downtown that will preserve unique character areas, retooling a demolition delay process so we'll have more positive impact, building acknowledgement that the city cannot reach its climate and carbon neutrality goals without recognizing that successful historic preservation is also good environmental policy. We're also working to get a commitment for more resources for the Landmarks Commission so that it can be more proactive. Finally, we're also active on the national level on issues such as federal policy, climate change, affordable housing, and skilled preservation trades workforce development through our work with the National Preservation Partners Network. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, as you see in this slide, in 2020, we reflected on our work within the larger reckoning after the murder of George Floyd and the outrage that ensued questioning how equitable or inequitable our work has been. And despite our activity throughout the city's neighborhoods and the work of our predecessors in the preservation field, despite making some progress, how upon examination inadequate our efforts have been. We've actively been working to be better and to grow in this process, realizing there is so much work to be done. 
we've already begun working with YW Boston to help guide us on equity issues. We've testified at places like city council hearings about the fact that systems we have in place to protect, preserve, and celebrate the historic resources in the city are inherently skewed away from places that represent BIPOC stories. In 2020, we began and continue to strongly remind people over and over that each and every Bostonian should be able to walk this city and find historic places that resonate with them, that tell stories of people that look like them, so that they can be empowered to recognize that each and every Bostonian can impact the present and future of this city. These places exist, but they are insufficiently recognized, protected, and celebrated. I know Brent Legs will be focusing on this in his talk, and it's why I'm so happy to have him here tonight as our keynote speaker. I'm pleased to introduce my friend and colleague Brent Legs, Executive Director of the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund, launched by the National Trust for Historic Preservation in 2017. I first met Brent when he was on the staff of the National Trust Northeast Regional Field Office in Boston. Since that time, Brent has not only taken on, but succeeded wildly as the first executive director of the Action Fund. Under his direction, the fund has raised tens of millions of dollars to be distributed across the nation to help preserve sites of importance to the Black stories in America, to help us to tell a fuller story. I can think of no one better than Brent Legs to help right that wrong and bring these essential elements of our nation's history to the rightful place. Brent, thank you for your work and thank you for sharing it with us tonight. I give you Brent Legs. Thank you, Greg. And good evening to everyone. It's always exciting for me to spend and share space and time with friends and colleagues from, from Boston. As Greg mentioned, I started working for the National Trust in 2005 and lived in Boston for eight years. And in many ways, the, the lessons that I have learned in my career was, was really founded uh, by my experience and, and time there. So my talk this evening is about our collective work to build a true national identity. And I wanna highlight my view of preservation in this current moment and my work to present a blueprint for how we can advance preservation, harness the real power as a tool for social justice. But I wanna start with this quote. So I'm sure you've heard of the cultural icon, Beyonce. And during her visual album, Lemonade, several years ago, I was compelled by this sentence, the past and the future merge to meet us here. So the past and the future merge to meet us here. I want you to keep this in mind. The United States, we had a system of slavery, legalized slavery for 250 years. This system resulted in a social disease that still stains all aspects of American society today. We continue to fight against the legacies of slavery. In 1853, and Pamela Cunningham and the Mount Vernon Ladies Association and their advocacy would create a successful campaign to preserve the home of our first US president, George Washington. It's called Mount Vernon. In essence, they birthed the US preservation movement that also began a slow and long process of creating cultural inequity within this emerging movement that we call historic preservation. Currently today, only 2% of the almost 100,000 places listed in our national inventory directly reflects the Black experience. 
less than 10% directly reflects the social and ethnic communities like Native American, Latino American, Asian American, LGBTQ, and women's history. So when I look at the stories and places preserved over time, they reflect the stories of a privileged few and our work is to fight against this cultural inequity. We're fighting against urban renewal and erasure. This is a once thriving commercial district in Charlotte, North Carolina called Brooklyn that no longer exists. Can you imagine the loss of financial and cultural capital in this one neighborhood? But we know that urban renewal and its impact and the erasure created all across the United States is a national issue. So we magnify that the financial impacts of, of these policies and systems or the loss of cultural capital, it would be substantial. We continue to fight against redlining and disinvestment. I wanna read something to you from the National Community Reinvestment Coalition. For decades, low income and minority communities were intentionally cut off from lending and investment through a system known as redlining. Today, those same neighborhoods suffer not only from reduced wealth and greater poverty, but from lower life expectancy and higher rates of chronic disease that are risk factors for COVID. When we walk through, experience, drive through disinvested communities, we have to begin to understand the impact to the well being psychologically, emotionally, environmentally to the people that live here. We continue to fight against racial terrorism. And it seems in this moment that this terrorism continues to expand to other ethnic communities. We all remember this moment in 2015 when a lone white nationalist would walk inside of a sacred house of worship murder nine church members. It was a moment of cultural reckoning and awakening for our nation. I'm proud to say that we invested $150,000 to help this church, Mother Emanuel, to restore their historic church sanctuary. We continue to fight against disrespect. This building that you see is located in Nantucket, Massachusetts. It's interesting how some aspects of society or some individuals in society express their cultural values in public space. This building is the second oldest extant church building constructed by African-Americans still standing in the United States. It's a shame that a building of this significance, of exceptional significance, would be disrespected in this way. And as Greg mentioned, summer of 2020 in the Black Lives Matter movement and the aftermath of the murder of George Floyd is a transformational moment. We can't disconnect our work in historic preservation from that moment. And it has forced us to ask questions like, what is our responsibility in helping to preserve the ephemeral and funerary sites like this in recognition of this living history to ensure that we never forget and to ensure that we always remember to say his name, George Floyd. We're fighting against symbols of injustice an injustice that has no boundaries, that's national and international, an injustice that has stood upon the American landscape and public space that signified 
community civic identities. And in many ways, it's how art has been used as a weapon to terrorize and, and intimidate Black America. So this is the Decatur House in Washington, DC. It's a National Trust historic site. And an unnamed protester in the shadows of the White House would write on the side of this historic national landmark these words. Why do we have to keep telling you Black Lives Matter? This moment of cultural reckoning expresses the ongoing fight against systemic racism in America. But I think Maya Angelou said it best. Our shared past is painful, but if we face it with courage, we don't have to repeat the same injustice. Now, I have the good fortune of being the founding executive director of the largest preservation campaign ever undertaken on behalf of African American historic places. It's a $25 million campaign to support the preservation of 150 African American historic places and to make investment in 150 Black communities. It's called the African American Cultural Heritage Action Fund. It was created in the aftermath of Charlottesville, another moment of reckoning. We all remember this image. This was on the campus of University of Virginia where white nationalists, our neighbors, ordinary citizens wearing khaki pants and polo shirts, holding tiki torches would organize and rally around a Thomas Jefferson sculpture on the only academic institution that's a World Heritage Site on a landscape of enslavement and a campus built by black hands. They would connect together, culture, heritage, and violence in public space. We knew this moment didn't reflect our cultural and national values. And we wanted to signal to the nation that preservation was a force for positive social change, that we could be social innovators and in, in many ways, our work is about confronting the miseducation of Americans. So the Action Fund is about making room, creating space for new stories and ideas. We work within our own understanding of history, preservation, and social justice. We are a movement and platform for creating a more just and equitable society. Now, the first thing that we did was to create a new form of partnership and community. Currently, we have a 20 member board that's called our National Advisory Council. It's co-chaired by Darren Walker, who is the president of the Ford Foundation and actor and director, Ms. Felicia Rashad. And I'm delighted that we have legendary esteemed leaders like Skip Gates and Evelyn Brooks Higginbotham, who is the national president of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, their organization founded by Carter G. Woodson. And she is currently the chair of the history department of Harvard University. So now I want to talk about preservation as a tool for equity in place. So we've all heard of James Madison. This is his home, Montpelier in Orange, Virginia, known as the father of the Constitution. So we work to develop a permanent exhibit that's in the basement of this main house that's titled The Mere Distinction of Color. And I encourage you, if you ever have a, a chance, it is one of the most innovative permanent exhibitions that I've toured that brings honor and life to the enslaved workers story at Montpelier. In 2018, we brought together 50 scholars and practitioners to develop a national 
rubric for teaching slavery interpretation and descendant engagement. We are actually applying that rubric in practice and we are exploring a shared governance and authority model where the descendant committee, which is its own official nonprofit, can collaborate in a co-agreement with the Montpelier Foundation. If we're successful, I believe it will be a transformational model for traditional sites across the country. You probably heard of President Woodrow Wilson, known for a lot of his successful international policies. He's also known for being a segregationist president. He segregated the federal government. His home is in Washington, DC. It's a National Trust historic site. And we wanted to use this space to express our value of equitable interpretation. Reimagining interpretation means engaging new audiences. So we worked with David Yarborough, who was an artist in residence. He then engaged Wellington High School students, and they created a new composition that highlighted the counter DC, counter -DC protest movement of the 1960s. It was performed inside of this space using Wilson's piano. And this is how we create transformation. The signature pillar of the Action Fund is our national grant program. And in, since January 2018, we have received almost 2,300 proposals asking for nearly $243 million. We've been fortunate through our partnership with the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation and others to invest almost 5 million in 65 Black communities thus far, and we'll invest another 1.6 million in July. We've invested in places like Boston Zone, African Meeting House, to help them expand their really creative and innovative programming. We've also partnered with the executive leadership of the museum who collaborated with us through a six month preservation leadership training. And I will say that at the end of this, they had significant cash reserves, the way they cleaned up their back house and operations. This museum is well positioned for its next 20 to 30 years. And I'm really excited to, to see what they will accomplish. There's a place called the Luster Mansion or the Lions Mansion that's in Oklahoma City, in Oklahoma. So this place is the only last historic buildings from a former thriving commercial and residential historic community called Deep Deuce. It's where Ralph Ellison would write about the culture and the art of this community. Unfortunately, urban renewal in the 1950s devastated, erased all but the last remnants from the Luster Mansion. You can see to the left, the first vernacular house that he, he and his family lived in. When he created wealth, being a business pioneer, they would construct this beautiful mansion. The retail shop you can see just in the corner in the back and the right. What's beautiful about this opportunity is the city understands that they could use preservation as a tool for making amends to repair the injustices from the past. And in essence, they see preservation as a way to reach reconciliation. We provided grant funding of 75,000 for planning and additional 50,000 to conduct a, um, a secondary business plan. You may have heard of Shaco Bottom, which is in Richmond, Virginia, second largest slave holding center in the United States. We funded an equitable development study that looked at this nine acre vacant lot that if you tour today was nothing more than concrete and, and pavement uh, parking lots. But in essence, it's an archaeological site that has a history that remains invisible, but the community draws power and connection to this place. So we needed to help them move beyond moral arguments to make 
economic development arguments. And so the equitable development study links together economic development, commemoration, and education. And this is what the community-driven vision for memorialization looks like. It was proud last summer that we invested in the National Center for Afro-American Artists in Boston to help them with capital improvements. This place is a hidden gem. It is one of the first centers and spaces for Black artists to express their art, their creativity, and their identity. It has great potential. Or another place like the home of Alice and John Coltrane in New York, we funded their first project manager's position that would oversee the stewardship planning for this site. Just completed a landscape architecture um, design plan for the three acre Passive Park, or finalizing plans for the building and the business model. But most importantly, we wanna equalize the dual narratives. Inside of a second floor bedroom is where John composed The Love Supreme, one of his greatest masterpieces. It's also where Alice recorded her first five albums in their basement studio. So our work of equalizing dual narratives is to bring greater recognition to the contributions of Black women in jazz and American history. I'm sure you have heard of the legendary playwright, August Wilson. This is his home in the historic Hill District in Pittsburgh. You probably saw Ma Rainey's Black Bottom recently, one of his plays or the movie Fences with Denzel Washington. What's beautiful about this is many African-American historic places are simple, unadorned, and have spatial constraints. So to be able to use the streetscape, the neighborhood, landscapes, to be able to create a new form of community and to engage that community through arts and history. And so we funded a fellowship program where they brought together artists that would perform and engage the communities. And this is what it looks like. I wanted to highlight our work on the West Coast, a place called the Whiffendale Ladies Club. What I think is so beautiful about this story is 50 Black women during segregation in Los Angeles would pool their limited resources and buy this elegant two-story residence and create their own social club and space. It tells a unique story about the Black middle class, a story that is often undertold and overlooked. There's great potential here at the Whiffendale Ladies Club. Or in Chicago, an artistic haven and former theater called the Forum. I wanted to highlight this because we all understand the power of preservation to be a catalyst for urban regeneration and revitalization. And this kind of project, it's a tax credit project led by a fantastic uh, visionary, Bernard Hopkins. And once it's complete, it will help to transform and build, grow a new creative economy on the south side of Chicago. You probably have also heard of Vernon AME Church that's in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It stands in the historic Greenwood neighborhood where the largest racial massacre in American history happened in 1921. The 100th anniversary is at the end of May. In advance of the anniversary, we provided our largest grant of $150,000 last summer to help the church restore their historic stained glass windows. It's one of the only standing remnants after the racial massacre. We're also intent of not just highlighting the negative aspects of, of Tulsa's racial violence and, and history, but we wanna make sure that Americans also understand the, the accomplishments of this community. Booker T. Washington, when he, he visited, he said that this was 
a, a Negro Wall Street, or what we call today the, the, the Black Wall Street. This neighborhood was the epicenter of Black commerce and economic activity. And we have to make sure that as we move forward our interpretation and preservation of this history, that we balance public memory. It's the truth of the painful past and the truth of the accomplishments as well. And then Claiborne Temple in Memphis, Tennessee, where we have partnered for three years. Inside of their basement is where the I'm a Man posters were pressed, designed and pressed. Inside of this church and from the front steps is where Dr. King will lead 15,000 protesters to City Hall in 1968 as part of the sanitation workers strike. What's beautiful here is this was a moment in the American civil rights movement that integrated political activism with economic justice. We draw lessons from African American historic places that guide us and that are all the more important in this moment in our history. So in the last section, I just want to highlight preservation as equity in practice. So in October, we released our new research and study. It's titled Preserving African American Places, Growing Preservation's Potential as a Path for Equity. It's a must read if you are a practitioner. And I just wanna highlight some compelling data it was a study across 10 cities, major markets and mid-size from LA to New York. And what we learned is that historically African-American neighborhoods had lower home ownership rates than other neighborhoods in nine in, of, of the 10 cities with Louisville and Atlanta having the greatest disparities. Across the study cities with available permit data, Historically, African-American neighborhoods had about 35% more demolitions per census tract and about 25% fewer building rehab projects per census tract than in other neighborhoods. I am hopeful that this report will equip practitioners to be able to advocate for equitable investment and, and strategies in BIPOC communities. But I'm also hopeful that we can bring forward new ideas that will increase both the cultural and financial value of historic African-American neighborhoods and assets. We also create equity by creating space for new ideas, new voices, like Brianna Rhodes, who's a freelance journalist who writes about our Action Fund grantees, or Candace Taylor, who is a leading cultural documentarian about Green Book sites, her book, Over the Over Ground Railroad, is a must read. Or Yoruba Richin, who pr produced the Smithsonian documentary on the Green Book, it's a must watch. And Jenna Dublin, who is completing her PhD in urban planning at Columbia, who was a co author of the equity study. And then last is our Hope Crew program, where we have paid positions for youth between the ages of 18 to 25. And we introduce them to preservation trades with the goal of cultivating the next generation of conservators that will take care of our diverse historic places. This is our work to cultivate the next generation of diverse professionals that will continue to bring innovation to the US historic preservation movement. We just launched a $1 million HBCU cultural heritage stewardship initiative in partnership with the National Endowment for Humanities and other funders. And I'm glad to say that last month we funded and are partnering with eight HBCUs where we are funding individual building preservation plans and two campus-wide preservation plans. And I'm hopeful over the next couple of years that we will go far beyond what the Getty Foundation and others have done decades ago to create real stewardship capacity at HBCUs, who steward one of the most diverse collections of 
historic buildings and landscapes, arguably anywhere in the world to tell the Black experience. So I'm highlighting all this to say that our collective work in this moment is about preserving American culture. We must, as a nation, revere and uplift Black culture and assets as American history. We have to partner with intention to reduce historical inequities. And we have to continue to innovate preservation practice to achieve measurable equity-driven outcomes. This is our America. And we have a responsibility to preserve what is permanent and what is temporary. So I wanna leave you with this. The past and the present merge to meet us here. So the past and the present merge to meet us in this moment. What future can we create together that reimagines Boston's story, that creates access and representation across Boston's historic built environment and landscapes so that all African American citizens, BIPOC citizens, begin to see themselves and their history and their potential and the historic assets that's around. Thank you. Thank you, Brent. That was amazing. I encourage people to ask questions in the Q&A. We've got a few minutes for questions. Um, and uh, it's such an amazing story. And I think your, your final point is the one that I've been reiterating ever since the last time I saw you spoke is that this is this is everybody's story. You know, it's 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 the fuller American story, as you like to keep saying. And I think that's an important part to reiterate that this isn't just a black story. Uh, it's the part of our story that we've hidden away for too long. Um, so thank you for um, the inspiring work, as someone noted in the chat. Um, while we're waiting for some questions, I guess I'll throw one out. Um, here in Boston, we've been struggling with some of our own issues. Uh, I'm on a subcommittee of the Boston Arts Commission. You may have followed that. The Arts Commission, um, after many public discussions, uh, voted to remove the Emancipation Group, uh, the copy of the sculpture that's in Washington, D.C., of President Lincoln standing over a uh, enslaved, formerly enslaved black man breaking chains, but uh, not portrayed uh, very positively. Now, now there's a struggle and the question is what to do with it. Um, there's been a host of discussions. Um, curious if you have any thoughts about that particular one or other things in that category. I would say the most important thing is, is not to erase the history. And, you know, if, if we're being technical, one of the four preservation treatments is technically relocation. So I would say that I don't know where I really stand on this issue. When I think about the conversation in Boston, I think my, my heart says that this has the potential to be the first public piece of sculpture that represents Black America following emancipation. And for us to remove or misunderstand the, the, the symbolism of that art. So I think the, the strategy is to put a pause on removing and, and try to convene communities in a deliberate way. I'd love to be able to have a, a national community of scholars, uh, a diverse community of scholars, that can put together a national strategy for responding to these kinds of, of, of issues. And what I don't wanna see happen is 10 or 15 years from now that we are creating a, a Disneyland-like civic space. And I think if we could just relax a little bit, 
put a pause on making you know, lasting decisions that hopefully a lot of well-intentioned smart folks can put together a plan that can be replicated in local communities. Great, thank you. We see a couple of questions come in. One is uh, looking for a little more information about the grant that was provided to the site behind me, the Center for African-American Arts in Roxbury. Can you give us a little more on that one? Yeah, so it was a capital grant to help them re replace their roof. And our funds were matching, I think about a million plus dollars that they had secured. And I'm so excited to help them maintain that historic building. And and I haven't explored how they are, are, are operating financially, but would love to see this place once again renewed with not only a beautiful building, but with an organization that is sustainable and and that this center is celebrated by all Bostonians. There's a lot of opportunity here, I think, for for others to provide investment and support. And I agree, and it's a site that we as the Alliance need to spend more time and dive. So you've encouraged me to do that. I made a note right here in my paper. A um, uh, couple other questions coming in. Um, the challenge of plantation sites, some associated with the National Trust, some not, um, in balancing interpretation and the stories not told about enslaved populations. Any thoughts about that? Yeah. I'm always looking for stories of power agencies, um, of resistance, because I think too often the Black experience is stereotypically defined through the lens of slavery, of the well-known stories of civil rights. But we don't know enough. We have not documented, identified, and illuminated more stories related to um, uh, resistance, Black love, and romantic life during slavery, during, you know, examples of self-emancipation. And I always like to use this example, which is at Fort Monroe. 1619 is where the first slave ship arrived to the New World. Fast track to 1861. Mallory Townsend and Baker, three enslaved men, they would flee, be considered contraband of war by Union General Benjamin Butler, and in the process would inspire 500,000 freedom seekers to follow in their footsteps, and it's this unknown catalyst to emancipation. That is a civil rights story, a human rights story. It's a story where African Americans are actors in history and not spectators. And I think that's the strategy. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Uh, and, I, and I think that that was some of the frustration with the, the imagery and the sculpture here in Boston, the, the passive role of the enslaved man. Mm -hmm. um, all right, since uh, I want to get to as many questions as we can, there's a question about what the trust is doing at Woodlawn. Um, I don't know if you have any comments on that specifically, since it's the trust property. I would just say that we funded 10 National Trust Historic Sites, including Woodlawn, to partner with African-American artists to expand interpretation. And Woodlawn, they, they work with a local artist, uh, a, a painter, and she pretty much in, interpreted the Black experience at Woodlawn and in the, in the Black community there. And I attended that event, and it was beautiful. You know, it's just amazing what a small amount of money can do, not only to help tell a new story, but to create a, a, a new sense of community. Yeah, I mean, it's. It, I think looking at these sites differently, and that sort of relates to another question here. You know, several of the sites you mentioned, you know, John Coltrane, August Wilson, Nina Simone, these are their homes. Uh, those of us in the business know, you know, we really don't need more house museums. Um, mm -hmm. The picture you showed of August Wilson's house didn't look like the, any house museum I knew of being interpreted. Um, can you talk more about that? And let's connect that with another question here about um, Black and BIPOC joy in sites that have done a good job connecting those. And is, is there a connection between those questions? Yeah, so I love the, the comment about joy. Because when we first created the Action Fund, our 
kind of ethos or, or our theme was that we wanted to preserve sites of activism, achievement, and community. And for me, joy and achievement are, are one and the same. And it's about communicating the joy that African Americans have. And I think that August Wilson photo expresses what community joy looks like. Whether it's black or multiracial and multi-generational joy, like beauty, is something that is our birthright and something that we all should experience and, and have access to. Related to your question about house museums, we all know that they are not sustainable. I think there are, are places that a house museum model works, like the Louis Armstrong House Museum that's in Queens, New York, National Historic Landmark, Authentic Collections. It's hard to imagine that space being used for anything else. And that's why they created a new visitor center across the street. But for the majority of African American historic places, there hardly have any collection. So it would be kind of reinterpreting, almost misleading a, a visitor. And again, it's not a sustainable model. So we are looking at hybrids and ways to kind of reframe. So it's creating a, a history site that has the potential to be market driven that explores the economic value of that site's history and that is responding more to the needs of the community. And so if they can position themselves not as solely a, a history site or an interpretive space, but as a cultural anchor and asset, that's where their potential lies. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think thinking how, how we break the model uh, and I'm hoping and willing, there are two more questions. I know we're nearing seven o'clock, but let's, uh, we're at seven o'clock. Let's see if we can tackle these two last questions because they read, oh, and a third one just came to see, you know. Um, I'm just gonna read this one. Are you discovering fresh interpretive approaches that express both the equal rights arguments and make people aware of what life felt like to African-Americans over time? New interpretive approaches. Yeah. I. I would say that just within the Action Fund, probably the best example is a rubric on teaching slavery interpretation and descendant engagement. That really is a, a national model. But um, there's a lot of books that have come out that I have bought and I have not read yet that I think helps to expand interpretation. My colleague, Elon Cook, who works in our historic sites department at the National Trust is conducting new research and interpretive models on sites of enslavement. And I'm sure others are doing really innovative work. And if anyone listening has examples, please share that with Greg so that, or send that directly to me because I I would love to collect more to be able to promote that work. That'd be great. And Brent's email address is easy to find. Mm -hmm. um, Let's see, any sites in Boston, Black history that you think are particularly important that need preservation? There's a long list, but any any come to mind as ones of particular significance that we're not doing a good job with? The, the yeah, I would love, love, you know, this gets back to the challenge of private ownership, but I would love to see the Malcolm X child at home be preserved and fully restored. I mean, that place deserves to be standing in its fullest glory with significant investment in its restoration, being interpreted to tell the story of Malcolm X and the Black Panther Party and, 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 and years ago, there was a really creative shared use strategy that was presented by um, um, Historic Boston. And I think that still has great merit and could be replicated nationally at other historic sites. So that would be, I think, one of the top. And then I would love to see, I go back to the Museum of African American History, Boston and Nantucket. I mean, you have the African Meeting House of 1806. It's the oldest, stand, oldest standing black church building in the United States. You got the Abel Smith School of 1835. I mean, I don't know where else in the country can you find rare examples like this this institution should have a $25 million endowment. They should be leading preservation and public engagement models because they're resourced to do that. So I will say to the Boston community, what does a stewardship strategy look like 
where that museum, the Afro Center of African American Artists, potentially the Malcolm X House and others, are stewarded at the same level as a James Madison's Montpelier or an Elkhorn Ranch or a, a, a Vanderbilt estate. That to me is, is the future of preservation is to find those innovative approaches that truly uplifts BIPOC histories, places, and communities. And for those who haven't been to that site, we held our annual meeting there a couple of years ago. And I can say personally, it's an incredibly powerful space. Mm -hmm. Walk into that space and know what happened there to be able to have the honor of standing on, on the stage behind the lectern. Um, that's one of those places that reminds you why historic places matter. It really resonates and blow, blows you away. So I encourage anyone who has not been there to visit to support that institution. We have a number of questions continuing to come in, but I want to be sensitive to people's time and people's Zoom burnout. Um, Brent, I thank you so much for spending time with us tonight. I apologize to those questions, including some from friends and preservation colleagues that we're not going to get to tonight. But as I said, Brent's email is pretty easily findable with a Google search. He's out there pretty easily. Thanks for all the good work you're doing. Uh, thanks for the support of sites in Boston. Um, and please stay in touch. And uh, we will continue this important work here in Boston at the Preservation Alliance. There's much to do, but it's an exciting time. And we're pleased to be able to play a part. So thank you, Brent. Um, and thank everyone for joining us tonight. We really appreciate all your support. Um, please follow us on social media. Um, we need your voices. As I said at the outset, we are an alliance. Uh, as Brent knows and shows through his stories, these preservation only works, as I, I often say, it's a team sport. So thanks for being part of our team. Thanks for supporting the alliance and have a good night. Thanks again, Brent.